Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. If they change, you kill the animal. If you want to fight Eric, I will down. give you a fight. Let him come. You abandoned me. You took her away and you abandoned me. Angel. Azazel. Emma. Banshee. We were supposed to protect them. Eric, where were you, Charles? You abandoned us all. Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show live on the 23rd of May. We are n- next week will be where we're halfway through the year already. It's, it's insane. It's insane how fast this uh Well, this we'll year be almost gone. almost we still have another month then because it's June we'll is be, the sixth. That's why I said we'll be needed yeah. halfway through the year, but it, yeah. it's insane how quickly this year has gone and looking back over the last 5 months I'm I'm gonna probably struggle at the end of the year coming up with a list of the best films because I've got like five, maybe four, but I really hope that the last half of the year is just as strong as this year, this start, the 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 start of the year, because I'm gonna struggle. <laughs> there's been some good ones, and there's been a well more than that of bad ones. Yeah, the, the, the problem is, though, a lot of the films that um, I've seen this year have either gone into the bad category or just gone into sort of like the middle area. Yeah, you like you like a lot of horror films, though, don't you? Yeah, but it makes it even more difficult for for us to try and come up with a, like, a top ten list of the year when stuff does that. So is there a chance that any of the films um, that we're looking at in this week's show will make it? You just never know. Well, in the cinema section, we have three films, and they are... We are running through uh, the big release of the week, really, I would say, is uh, X-Men Apocalypse, the sixth film in the X-Men series. Uh, We have uh, Tom Hanks appearing in a uh, film adapted from the novel uh, A Hologram for the King. And we have a small sort of independent um, drama about uh, a band in Ireland in Sing Street. And as normal, we get a Marvel film for the US. Well, why do we know what that is? Why? Why? Why is that the case? I think it's the fact that it's it's maybe uh, to build momentum, to build interest in it, and then have it be because it, it gets you know like released here and then opens in America, and then everyone goes and rushes and sees it in the weekend, and it gets a big weekend number. It, it's still though that I've always wondered why it was the case that yeah. we um, we get them a week before America, considering that piracy is like a huge, just a foot. It's massive now. And so it, it's surprising to get a big release like that released in, we get it a week before America does, when I'm, you should just be releasing them at the same time. I'm not complaining. I know you're not <laughs> complaining because you're the superhero person out of yeah. a lot of us. So. Um, on Blu-ray and DVD we're looking at quite a few films actually, including this lot. Uh, we have the uh, Oscar winning uh, double bill of Spotlight and then The Big Short. Uh, we have then um, degrading quality of Dirty Grandpa. We have a uh, the alien aspect of the fifth wave. Then we're rounding out with some a few smaller films: Victoria, Kindergarten Cop 2, and Pandemic. Yeah, a sequel nobody asked for. On top of that, we have. Wait, 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 wait. Do we need to clarify which of those is the sequel? I know one no, of them has. The I know one of them has two in the title. Well, fifth wave. A number beside it, <laughs> not in it, beside it. It's not called the fifth wave. Two, we have two. Yeah, uh, well, that would be the sixth wave, wouldn't it? Really? No, no it oh, could oh. be still called the fifth wave. Two. Now, on top of that, we have a TV movie of the week, the Blu-ray and DVD top ten, the UK box office top ten. Before we kick off with some movie news, make sure you, uh, you click the little chat bubble in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. You can get in contact with us during the show. You can also check out the website MondayMovieShow.co.uk, Facebook.com forward slash MondayMovieShow, Twitter at MondayMovieShow. Thought I'd get all that kind of stuff out of the way with, but movie news, you don't have any, do you? I don't, but apparently...
hello 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 <laughs> I have no idea what happened there but for some reason it seems as if I went offline and then it came back on and I don't know if Stuart is still here or not hello hello can you hear me yep uh, we are still live surprisingly although for some reason the internet I think completely cut off and then went back on um, which is brilliant <laughs> yeah so I don't Skype know Skype issues <laughs> yeah and internet issues and internet issues yeah uh, fingers crossed that's not going to happen again yeah um it's been a while though. <laughs> yeah. It, it it's, it's, a, it's a, a question of time. it is the question of do we continue this because as far as I can tell, we are still live on Spreaker. It has Why continued not? going. We, we, we've always <laughs> said that if there is a mix up, a mess up, or anything like that, we should just keep on it in. That's the yeah. whole reason why we don't edit the show or anything if, like that. So if this was actually radio, we would have had dead air for about two minutes there, I think. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody who's listening in, into the show, thanks for sticking with us over that last couple of moments of, let's just see uh, the internet decider imploding and Skype just going, no, we're not working. Um, anybody listen to this on podcast, yeah, there was a problem there. There isn't a problem with your um, generic fruit-based MP3 player or any other device that you use to listen to us. Yeah. Trust us, we were still here. Mm -hmm. It's just the internet wasn't. So it's sort of like going back to the old days where you used to record your own radio shows on cassette. Yeah, but we we're not going to do that and post cassettes out to people. No, I don't think that that would be well fun to do anyway. No, so the professional thing to do would be to go straight into the movie news then. Yeah. Um, okay. I, just, I, I don't know how much of that you got. What I was saying, I was I was actually working on a film shoot this weekend, so I haven't been able to get a really be online much and do much. So, movie news is all yours. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, I, I don't have a lot of movie news this week, actually, to be honest. Um, surprisingly, normally I have about 10, 15 news stories, but it was more like superhero stuff and just speculations and all that kind of things. So rather than just solid news, it's a lot of hit and miss stuff. But um, the Daily Mail, which is the best place oh, to yeah. go all your news. Oh, yeah, that's a good source right there. Are reporting that Daniel Craig has turned down an offer of sixty-eight million pounds to play James Bond for a further two films. Tom Hiddleston looks to be the favourite to take over from him after betting was frozen or cancelled when um, his odds were slashed. Hmm. I, I definitely don't think it'll be Tom Hiddleston. I just don't see him as Bond. I don't think he's the right type for it. Um, I mean, I could be wrong. I didn't see Daniel Craig as him when, I, and then. Casino Royale came out and I was completely blown away um, I have been hearing all these things about that Daniel Craig is not going to do anymore and I I kind of put mm, a, a bit of caution to that because I think I view it kind of like how Robert Downey Jr. always seems to say I'm not doing Iron Man anymore and then he signs up to do more Iron Man stuff and seems to be saying oh I might, I might want to do another Iron Man film it all comes down to I think opinion and, and basically making a point of saying I don't want to do it but if you maybe pay me this much I might do it or give me a back end deal which the back end deal basically means it gets a percentage of the film's profit so because I think he I think he did get that on one of the Iron Man films and that would be quite a lot obviously because they're getting two billion dollar marks as we're seeing Bond seems to normally do that well as well I don't know if that maybe if, if Daniel Craig is doing a similar kind of bargaining chip thing if he is, I'll be amazed if, he, if he's actually turning down 68 million, because 68 million, whatever your your deal is on the profits of a film, 68 million is probably a really good deal for two films. Um, so I don't know. I, again, it's a Daily Mail, so do we entirely believe it? The thing, and no surprise that I'm going to lash onto the Bond franchise again, but. I think it's probably about time it, it needs something injecting back into the series because you can't follow the same kind of blueprints that has been happening with the last few Bond films like they, they've gone down the serious route, they, they've they've gone down way too much, the fact that yeah. when you turn around, it, it's just a, a speck in the distance of just um, anything else that, than what Bond should be um, it, it's just 
it's lost its weight. I, I think it's about time that it should be handled by somebody else. It needs an injection. It needs something different injected into it. We need a different bond. We need a di- definitely need a different director. Yeah, that's uh, Sam what I was Mendes say. needs to just go away from the series, and it needs to be put into the hands of it. I'm not seeing go down the route of a Jason Bourne film because we don't need two no. movies to feel exactly the same. No. Um, I'm not seeing it needs to go down the route of like a Mission Impossible, where it, it's more about the spectacle, more about the set pieces, because Bond has never been like that, but it just needs something to be injected back into it. it it's it, it's lacking pretty much a lot of things, and Spectre was the case. Spectre was just a boring film. Mm. It was, I don't know about boring, but it, just, it wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't live up to a Bond film. It, it 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 failed to reach the targets that were set for it by the franchise. It just. It, I think it's lost its way. I think it's a series that really does need something sorted out with it. Um, speaking about a series that should have lost its way and just never sorted out, the new Transformers movie has been given a new name in the form of Transformers: The Last Night. Um, it's also been confirmed that Josh Dummel is returning to the series. So, yeah, like, we really do need him to return to the series. Uh, I can also confirm, because I actually have news to add in that case, uh, Mark Wahlberg is definitely returning as well. Yay. Uh, and they've already started filming earlier than they were planned to. They started filming in Cuba. Yay. Um, so, you know, it's another Transformers film. I, I'm not going to lie. I do watch them. I do find them visually entertaining barely but i mean i i'm not gonna lie i actually have them in my my blu-ray collection because they are big big budget special effects things that are kind of like sit there and go oh wow pretty and that's about it but you know i they are kind of a sit down brain off watch it and that's it you know sort of thing and there's something there's something to be said for that there is a uh, you know, it's not necessarily a great series of films, but they're not as bad as, so we say, some of the films we're covering in the DVD section. Still, or that's not. No. For the amount of money being thrown at the screen, there should be a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's a difference between that there should be um, better and they should just stop. <laughs> just, just stop. Um, the full cast list for Thor Ragnarok has been released. Joining the cast of the um, the previous films includes Kate Blanchett, and she will play the villain called Hela. Uh, Jeff Goldblum, who will be playing the Grand Master. Tessa Thompson, who you saw in Creed, she will be playing the hero of Valkyrie. Carl Urban, who will be playing a character called Scourge. And Mark Ruffalo will be returning as Bruce Banner slash Hulk. And it's going to be directed by Taika Waititi. Okay, so this is and this is sorry, I didn't get the I wasn't I was reading something at the time there, but the, for this is for Thor Ragnarok. Ragnarok, yeah. Okay, I'm I'm wondering the whole thing of the Hulk being in the Thor film is that it's just a thing that completely throws me off it. Um, some of the casting there is okay. I, I'm not sure with Kate Blanchett. I mean, she's got she's definitely got screen presence, but. I, I don't know. We'll have to see. But it's just think of the the Hulk being in the Thor film. The only thing I can think of, I hope they're doing it, is to try and set up, you know, Planet Hulk. I want them to do Planet Hulk. But come on, you didn't um, uh, scorn at the fact that Iron Man was in the last Captain America film. Um, no. There was a ton of characters in the Captain America film. They've taken one Marvel character yeah. who wasn't in the Captain America film and just going, you know what? He was. Uh, let's just put him in this film. In, but it was in some way, shape, or form. It, it, exactly. That's the thing, though. In the in 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 Civil War, it was a whole thing of it's. It is an ensemble thing of that. There's a Civil War thing going on. It's, it's the it's a thing that divides them and opposes them. In in Thor Ragnarok, it's a thing that happens. It's going to destroy Asgard, and and, and the thing is. Is the Hulk going to be responsible for that? Why is the Hulk there? Is the question. I mean, well, it, it could be just the fact that he needs the help from uh, Bruce Banner on something. It, hmm. It's not saying that um, that Mark Ruffalo is going to be playing the Hulk in it. He could just be playing Bruce Banner in the film, and so he could be just there to um, because he needs some help, some something to do with the portal or or something like that. So it, it could just mm. be down to that. That's possible, but in that case, it would be. 
kind of disappointing, I think, to the audience. They would expect at some point Ruffalo to Hulk out. Still, Lord, it's, it's just... Uh, um, Captain America had all those ones, yet people didn't uh, bad mouth it, but because of the fact that Hulk is going to appear in Thor, oh no, we can't have that. Uh, mm. with the other cast and Kate Blanchett, um, she's got that malevolent kind of bad guy there to her. You look at Galadriel in Lord of the Rings, everybody thought she was all light and magic, but wh there is a scene in, um, in Lord of the Rings where she does show some evil side of her, so she's got that kind of malevolence in her so mm. she's sort of like got the same kind of quality as Tilda Swinton she she can be sort of like um, a chameleon of an actress and then throwing people like Jeff Goldblum and um, <laughs> Carl Urban into the cast as well that's yeah, a really so it, good and interesting casting Jeff Goldblum is going to be the is going to be the weird one because <laughs> Jeff Goldblum just plays always just plays Jeff Goldblum he doesn't, he doesn't play any other kind of role. He's just lucky that the roles are always written to suit him. He's, he always does this weird kind of... The way he sits, stands there and looks looks slightly to the left, slight, you know, a squint on, and then sort of... It's almost like someone standing there massaging his ears or something. It's just... Yeah, so I watch it. It's just... you, you, you watch Independence Day when it comes out later in the year. It's going to be the same Jeff Goldblum thing, but it will be just fine because it's not about him. It's about buildings and stuff being destroyed. To be honest, I don't care. There was a lack of there was a um, a big gap where there was a lack of Jeff Goldblum in films, and it's nice to see him back. And so the, the, Jeff Goldblum has that kind of spirit on screen where yeah. he can uh, alleviate um, a dull scene or, or something like that. He, he just has that quality with him. So he he was nice underused to... in. Um, uh... The Grand Budapest Hotel. It's nice that they're actually looking at different actors who you would never expect. Yeah. It, it, it's giving them a, a chance. Um, a new Garfield movie's in the works from the producers of the Angry Birds movie. An original created Jim Davis. The film will also be a fully animated movie, so it'll not be a CGI live action mess. And it will uh, not feature Bill Murray. Hmm. Oh, Bill Murray. I thought Bill Murray was actually quite good as the voice I didn't have a problem with him I, you know maybe it's just a, I mean especially he can definitely do voice in, I mean we saw um, uh, him doing Baloo in Jungle Book and he was fantastic in that yeah still though they, they made him sing well they made him sing you can only call it singing if you can actually call what Russell Crowe did in Les Mis singing I know but still though <laughs> they made him sing they made Christopher Walken sing in that movie as well so that's a double travesty and uh, last piece of news that I've got. Um, remember last week when you ridiculed the fact that there is going to be a play moon? Yes. <laughs> and you couldn't stop laughing about that. No. <laughs> well, there is four video game franchises which are now getting turned into films also. Tetris? I'm, ac I'm actually going to put them in order of just stupidness. Okay. Missile Command. I don't think that's stupid. Well, yeah, I think that would work, yeah. Which will definitely work because it's a very straightforward one. Aliens come down to Earth, tanks and stuff like that need to kill them. Yep. Centipede. Yeah, this is the one that's just... Ugh. Centipede that could go down the shark Nero kind of route and make ugh. it a very tongue-in-cheek kind of cheesy movie. We've seen all of these anacondas and um, all of these mega shark opaluses and stuff like that. So shark Nero is going into space with the fourth film. So it, it, it's it, it's one of those ones where it might work for a ridiculous Why? one as long as I understand it's going to be ridiculous. Why? Why shark at all? Oh. Um. Uh, Fruit Ninja. <sighs> it's slightly <laughs> rubber. Uh, yeah, yeah, puzzle game. It's like the Tetris one. Puzzle games into a real life film. Oh. Fruit, fruit, what what's happened? Mutant bananas are going to attack the Earth, and you need to stop them. I, I, I don't get you, that one. You stop them by pairing them up in a line of four of them. That, that's not how Fruit Ninja works. <laughs> Is it not? I, I don't know. I just know it's one of these types of games. Fruit Ninja is an iOS and Android game where you've just got lots of fruit on the screen and you need to swipe through them. Like cut them in half <laughs> and avoid bombs. That's Fruit Ninja's premise. And Tetris. Yeah, Tetris is the one I knew about. However, Tetris is not going to just be one movie. It's going to be three, a trilogy of films... It's going to have a budget of around about eighty million dollars, and it's going to have an entire Chinese cast, and hmm. it's going to be a sci-fi thriller. Yeah, but I mean, actually, have you seen some of the weird China, the weird 
sci-fi thrillers that come out of China though because they do have this they, they do have this kind of this corner on the market of just absolutely balls to the walls crazy sci-fi ideas and things that sometimes they're completely ridiculous but they sometimes oddly work there's, there's some out there that are just really weird and if they made them in a western cinema or a western studio they wouldn't work but somehow they managed to work when they're made by China because of I don't know just the the way they view things or the way that they have a, an ethic on things or the ideas are different you know it's just it's something that they can actually pull off at times so that might not be a bad thing yeah it's a Tetris film yeah then again so yeah it will be a bad thing um, let's go on to the UK box office top 10 then, and just before we get into the top 10 a few notable films well very little notable films that are absent from the top 10 including the remake of Cabin Fever which only opened on 22 sites my cinema was one of the places which showed it so it was just weird that it only took £3,000 from 22 sites um, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot also fields a miserably yeah, in the top ten. The number thirteen, um, which I and I really enjoyed it. I'm, it seems to have though had a had a real kind of short end of the release issue. It, it's got I, I think I mean that and the film at number ten, which we'll get to in a moment. I think we're both on very very limited releases and not given a fair chance of audiences being able to go to them, and very I think very little amount of advertising as well. Well, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, that's not true because I saw quite a few posters regarding Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. I held um, it My cinema any. again showed it. This is a cinema which will not didn't show um, the movie at number 10 and they showed Whiskey Tango Foxtrot and Cabin Fever and it opened on, up on 123 sites. Whereas um, the film um, above that, Mustang, it only opened up on 43 sites and yeah, that took £65,000. Well. That's, that's not bad, that. And, and Mustang's actually a really good film. But um, that, like I said, that that only opened up on 43 sites compared to 123. Mm-hmm. So 80 sites less, and it still took more than Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. So it, 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 um, people might have just been put off. When I went to see any weird Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, I was the only one in the screening of it. So it, it, I think it was just marketed wrongly or mm-hmm. put into cinemas, which probably was a bit of a bad idea to do that because it wasn't going to get the audience. But um, in the top ten, though, at number ten is a new entry for Green Room. Yeah, which is a it's a very good indie film. As it's a kind of the follow up to Blue Ruin by the same director, um, and it's got that very kind of oppressive feel that Blue Ruin had. But it also takes it up a notch and and turns it into this whole tense um, sort of trapped thriller with extreme moments of shock and gore. Um, and it, it's it's actually getting a lot of people are raving about it. I thought it was really really well, hand, well handled. I I did love the the performance, especially by uh, Patrick Stewart in it. Um, Anton Yelchin is really really good in it as well. And, and it's just it's it's a it's a real all round shocking thriller film. It's not a horror film. It does have a horror aspect to it, but it's not really a horror film. It's more of a thriller thing. But it's it's got this kind of this real sort of gut punching tension to it which you don't get in a lot of films now and it's one of the rare times that a film is rated 18 now and it really does earn that 18 rating it's a movie that I'm annoyed that I haven't been able to see because <laughs> um, cinemas just decided to just show it pretty much for one week <laughs> and I, if that was the case I was hoping that it might have been a film where it was shown in cinemas for like a week maybe 10 days and then released on Blu-ray and DVD because Cabin Fever the remake of Cabin Fever, that's it on Blu-ray and DVD next Monday, mm. next week. So it's had a week in cinemas, a bit of a, a gap, and then it's released on Blu-ray and DVD. I was hoping that Green Room might be the case in that, that front. Um, fingers fingers crossed that it might get speed tracked um, on the Blu-ray and DVD because I really do want to see it. It's just annoying that no cinema is actually showing it now. Yeah, I mean, you, hopefully you'll maybe get lucky a bit because it seems to be drawing opinion for people and people want to see it. So it might get a little bit of a maybe a bit of a distribution to some other cinemas that haven't had it yet because it's now kind of it's it's getting the praise it is. Well, unfortunately, that that won't happen because of the fact that next week you you've got Alice through the Looking Glass out on Friday, and next Monday you've got the new Turtles film and Warcraft. So you've mm. got those three big movies released in the space of a few days. So they're going to take up a lot of screens, and then you've still got. 
Captain America, you've still got the Jungle Book, you've still got the Angry Birds movie, so it's not going to find a space in the cinema now. It, I would have loved if Curzon stood it and, and just you know, go, you know what, let's put it on demand. I want more films to do that. It gives people a chance to see smaller films. That um, mm. Number nine's Eye in the Sky. Which I really, really liked. It's a good moral dilemma film, but it's it's the fact that it's got some great performances and it is a largely performance cast piece. Um, but it's, I really, again, a thriller. It's a, a good tension, but it's it's a film that will you'll walk out of it and you'll have all these questions about how you would react in that situation and how you would do or not do what the characters did. And it's it's a real kind of moral dilemma quandary of a film. Yeah, but quickly back the curse on the R following us on Twitter. Okay, which is nice. That is um, nice. It's awesome to see that. I just I got a pop up one day and saying curse on demand are following you, so they're <laughs> following us on Twitter. And number eight, um, quickly gloss over. It's a secret cinema. Twenty eight days later, it's it's only shown in one place. It's still doing stupidly brilliant for itself. I don't know how long it's going to be open for, but uh, we we can't um, yeah. get to see this kind of thing. I think it'll probably and, be on another couple of weeks. I think it's normally about two months on. And number eight is a new entry for Richard Linklater's new film, Everybody Wants Some. And I know we said last week we'd try and see it if we could to review it because we weren't able to see it last week in time for the show. Haven't been able to see it this week either. I've um, been just as busy as you Yeah, were, so. and I do want to see it. I am. I, I, I was wondering whether or not it was actually going to make it into the top ten because I know it hasn't had a massive release in places. Yeah, it's, I, I, I don't think it's been given, though. A lot of the ones I saw it, it's had like one showing a day or something. It's not been given the kind of showings that a lot of other cinemas have, uh, have given other films. Oh, what um, Boyhood got, because Boyhood in its second week got expanded to yeah. more cinemas. Yeah, and I don't think that will happen with this because I don't think this is going to... I mean, I don't think this will be... I obviously haven't seen this, but I don't think from... I'm not hearing anything special about it saying, oh, yeah, this is that good. You know, it's not drawing that attention. It's probably going to be, I think, around um, in the top 15 next week. I don't think it'll be in the top 10 next week because obviously what's come out now and then all the things going on. But I do want to try and see it. I am going to try and see it. Hopefully I will. I don't know. Uh, number six is a new entry for our kind of creator. Which is a, a good um, adaptation of a John Le Carroll novel. It is a um, decent performance from Ewan McGregor. A really good performance from Stella Skarsgård. He, he just basically you could you could watch him sitting there reading, you know, a, a takeaway uh, mat you know, a, a takeaway uh, manual, and it, you'd just be sitting there, you'd just be transfixed watching him. It, you know, it's it's that kind of a an acting film. It's a good ten- tension builder as well. It does get predictable towards the end, but I did enjoy it and I thought it was well handled. And number five is Flor- Florence Foster Jenkins, which is a great one of these kind of good feel feel good films. Good feel feel good, uh, feel good films. Um, it's not the best feel good film I've seen this year. Um, that would actually go to um, Eddie the Eagle. I think it was a, a better feel-good film. This, though, this one will possibly be a film which would appeal more to a more mature audience. Um, and it has got a great sort of comeback performance for Hugh Grant, who I think until he was cast in this had actually given up acting in films. He was uh, convinced to come back for this um, because of the fact he's acting with Meryl Streep. Um, and the both of them give great performances, and so does I forget his name, but you know his name, Simon Helber. Yes, thank you from The Big Bang Theory, who's a great kind of the, the supporting foil to uh, the character and to the actors in the film. Um, and it's a really surprisingly, I mean, it's it's a it's a sort of safe film. It doesn't really take any chances. Nothing big can happen with it. It is a PG film, and I don't have a problem with that. It, it's it's a it is one of those things. You know, you go and see it, and it's you walk out, and you go, yeah, it was good. It's it's not fantastic. It's not you know going to win awards or anything, but it is a enjoyable pass of the time. It's a good film. I'm going to remember Simon Helberg's. Um performance in the film and I think he's probably shooing to be one of my nominations for best supporting actor at the end of the year for our awards because he it, it, it when it comes to the supporting categories it's harder to sometimes remember the supporting roles over the the lead roles and his stands out and I think it's going to be standing out for the rest of the year mm-hmm. so that yeah I, I think he, he's going to be remembered in my um, end of the year award for best supporting actor he deserves it from that front anyway it is a good performance from him it is a very good performance from him and number four is Bad Neighbours 2 which I was surprised that I, that I enjoyed it as much as I did um, it's better than the first film I thought it does um, have some moments that are 
it does start to kind of raise the whole issue of the sexism thing between um, the what are they called sororities and um, fraternities Um, but it's also the fact of that it shows there's actually kind of been thought of what happens next for these characters from the first film instead of just doing more of the same it goes we're doing more of the same but we're having it happen after the characters have gone through and they've actually kind of grown up a bit from the first film and that is the kind of the thing you don't get so much with comedies now they don't really bother with that a lot of times they just come back and they go oh yeah business as usual same thing happens you know that's it this actually just tried to move on a bit and I was you know impressed by that yeah I haven't seen it I, I, I you need honest, to, you need for it. you need to see them now to in order to be ready for when this third one that comes out you're talking about. Yeah, the zombie one. It's <laughs> an idea what they've got for us, a third one involving zombies, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, number three is the Jungle Book. Amazing uh, work by uh, John Favreau. It is incredible just how much uh, a film that is probably ninety ninety five percent special effects can actually get to you when it's done properly and done with some heart uh, and it's really incredibly visually entertaining as well as having a good story and also a great performance from the the one actor in the film um, and I, I we were saying about uh, earlier voice acting the voice acting is really good as well with the the cast you have in there doing the the voices of all the animals um, so it's it, it's managed to bring that that magic of the Jungle Book animation to the screen in live action form essentially almost live action but it's CG of course yeah voice wise I think for me what stands out is I love Scarlett Johansson's voice anyway Lupita Nyong'o is really good I think uh, she brings um, uh, something to uh, Carr's voice she's got that mesmerising kind of voice to it but I agree Lupita Nyong'o is the one that stands out more so she's got very softness sort of like maternity to her voice she really does care um, for Mowgli and you can definitely tell that it's weird to see a wolf really care for a a boy cub but it's just the way she actually brings the passion across in her voice and so I would gladly listen to both of those two have an argument with each other or read the phone book out or, or something like that because I would just it would easily relax me and send me to sleep in a good way rather than a oh this is boring kind of way. They, they need to do a film where they just get people like them and like you know Charles Dance as well to just sit there reading you know manuals of stuff or something and then out of, out of nowhere <laughs> Brian Blessed just bursts in with his loud massive voice and they kick him out or something like that don't don't start you'll get me on to doing Brian Blessed impersonations no please don't the number two is new in for the angry birds which i haven't seen even though i do want to see it yeah i reviewed it last week it's not bad it's completely inoffensive um it's got a few funny moments and it's it, it again it's down to the voice cast when you've got a good voice cast josh gad is the one who stands out the most from it but it, 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 that's obvious considering how he's got that really unique voice but the way he brings character to that voice and so It was a movie that seemed pretty much doomed on paper. People looked at the idea and thought, an Angry Birds movie? That was never going to work, considering it's just a puzzle game where you throw little birds at pigs. But they actually managed to flesh it out into a story. I don't know if it'll actually work on multiple stories. Um, It's a franchise. They're probably going to milk it movie-wise. It's done pretty good for itself as well. It, It went straight in at number one at the US box office. So well done for it on it's that not, front. Not yeah. far off doing that here, though. It's not. It's not much of a difference between that and the number one film this week. Completely inoffensive movie. It, it's fun for the kids. And the number one is Captain America: Civil War. I was just going to say, actually, do you think Angry Birds would have benefit from having people like uh, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller having done it? No, because um, to be honest, it is very kid centric. It's very like like straightforward kid kind of film, and I think. Um, even though Phil Lord and Christopher Miller have done that kind of movie before, they, they didn't need, to, they wouldn't have needed to do something like this, to be honest. Okay. And that's not saying that they're above something like an Angry Birds movie, but the the voice talent alone is the thing that is the big saving grace of the film. If you took the, the people who do the voices in the Angry Birds movie out and give it to somebody else, I don't think it would have as enough character there. But because they've got a good cast when it comes to the voiceovers. Um, I think that's what adds to the film but Captain America Civil War yeah um, I mean it's, what more can we say about it I I think it's uh, one of Marvel's best films I'm kind of tied between that and Winter Soldier I I, I do really really love them both um, I think that it's nice because Marvel is doing this thing where they're clearly making the films 
to be based on a type of film not not just be a comic book film they're actually making they're trying to make them sort of fit into like conspiracy thriller to or you know political thriller sort of am- angles to them and it works because it, it makes it interesting and as well as having the characters in there that we know and are, are interested in so i think it's a really well handled film and i and i really look forward to the russo brothers working on future films yeah i'm um it's me in comic book films i did like it but i i didn't fall in love with it i've got major problems with it mm-hmm. um onto the new releases of the week and coming up is hologram for the king and sing street however the big release of the week is the new x-men film so take it away yeah uh, apocalypse which is the sixth of the x-men films or you can you sort of consider it the the uh, eighth film because you do have the two wolverine ones that have been done so far as well but oh, the- third part of the second trilogy yeah it is, it is basically the the, the final the part of the syndrome. yes <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment um of course carrying on from the last film days of future past which was kind of like a, a kind of a reset of things uh we have now the um the story continues with you have professor xavier played by james mcavoy you have magneto played by uh, michael fassbender um and mystique played by jennifer lawrence are are sort of the main carryovers from the previous films and the characters that we know from them um things have got to sort of been split separately from them they're all going their own ways xavier is running the school that he's uh, set up uh, uh, magneto's sort of in hiding living out a life with a um um a, a a new wife and daughter that he's had sort of 10 years since the events where he sort of revealed the existence of um, mutants to the world um and uh, mystique is kind of doing the sort of the underground railroad thing of going around rescuing mutants in distress and helping them sort of go on to live a new life um things sort of come to a head when uh, a sort of a, a superior sort of mutant being who is thousands of years old um that was born around about the time of uh, the ancient egyptians um ended up in some kind of a stasis thing which we see at the beginning of the film that happened is awoken from his sleep um and has a, an effect on the world um and starts to sort of bring about what could possibly be the end of days because of the fact of that he is so powerful and so almighty he really considered himself a god here's a clip ever since the world found out about mutants in 73 there have been cults who see them as some kind of second coming or sign of god i was tracking one of them they call themselves a sheer n sevenure named after an ancient being they believe to be the world's first world's first what the world's first mutant these describe a specific set of powers greater than any man could possess an all-powerful mutant Exactly. And wherever this being was, he always had four principal followers, disciples, protectors he would imbue with powers. Like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He got that one from the Bible. Or the Bible got it from him. So you have this this whole thing going on that you have the, the kind of the three stories as they start to obviously come together of these characters and then also apocalypse or en sabah uh, nur as, he, as he's called um and uh, and played by oscar isaac as well who's pretty much unrecognizable in the makeup he's wearing um, he's like the bad guy from the um, uh, power rangers movie <laughs> um, and, and you had heard in that clip there you have Rose Byrne who is returning as Moira McTaggart the character from First Class the uh, the fourth X-Men film um, and you have introduced into this now it's a weird thing because you have characters that you know from the earlier X-Men films but bear in mind this is now taking place a bit earlier than that you have the, the characters of Jean Grey and Cyclops um, and uh, Nightcrawler being kind of reintroduced as their younger selves um and that is where i think the film in particular really stumbles uh, it has a problem of that it's setting up these new characters as much as we obviously know them already it's setting up them uh, and their younger their younger versions um which is fine to do but but brian singer i think seems to be a little bit stuck in that area when he's trying to set up new characters because it feels as if it's 
spending a lot of time setting up the film setting up these characters not just for this film but it's setting them up it feels for another trilogy to come afterwards um you have ty sheridan playing the young cyclops you have sophie turner playing jean gray and nothing against sophie turner who is a good actress but in this film i think she has been miscast slightly i don't think she's the best fit for the, the character and for the film Cody Schmidt McPhee is uh, plays Nightcrawler, and he's perfectly fine. There's, there's nothing especially brilliant about his character. It doesn't have the the presence that there was from uh, it, the the character being introduced in originally in the second X Men film. Um, so there is a bit of a, a weakness there, and the problem with that is because there are just so many characters in the film. It's a film that struggles to handle all of its characters. You have a lot of characters as well. Things like uh, there's the character of Angel, which was from um, in the X Men: The Last Stand, the third film, which really, really badly mistreated the character and kind of threw him away. And the same thing happens in this film to the character. It's a character I would have liked to have seen properly developed in the X Men series because it's a character that I do know from the comics and I just wish we would have been given that character it feels very much like we were given not much of them at all the character of Storm is very underused and, and given very little to do the character of Magneto at one point is reduced to basically a plot point which I found really kind of disrespectful of a character you've been spending six films to set up and, and having there and all of a sudden just dispose of them to be in the background it does have I feel a lot of the time of sequences put in there because the studio's gone do this or do that or we need this to you know do set up the next things you have the return of uh, Quicksilver from the previous film Evan Peters returns um, and does a sequence which is a largely a, a, re- a repeat of the the sequence the way in the kitchen from um, the last film and it feels almost a bit of a parody of itself which for me just really didn't work as much as it was a good sequence it felt very added in didn't exist it didn't match the rest of the film um, and there's the thing is because it's doing all this setup in the first hour very little actually happens on the screen there's and I, I'm, I'm not one of these people who thinks it should be all action all action all action but it needs something action in there to, to keep it going a bit and not just pace it out completely so I don't think it's the worst X-Men film I still think that is X-Men The Last Stand but it's a film that is far too baggy too many characters the running time is too long because it's two hours and 20 odd minutes um, it doesn't need to be that long um, it, it's, it's almost kind of feels like someone went um, okay we're, we're releasing this film in 2016 there's these two other superhero films coming out which have you know fairly big cast of all these people coming together and they have two and a half hours so so director Brian Singh and here you go you can have two and a half hours to do your film and he's gone oh yeah lapped up and then gone i got 20 minutes left um, I'm going to fill it with this 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 and this and it, just because you have two and a half hours doesn't mean you have to use two and a half hours it, it, it feels too long too baggy and it's really disappointing because I wanted it to be so much more and it's not a um, few things, firstly um, the proof and the fact that it, it, it's going to have a bit of a, a scattergun approach as if you look at the poster straight away considering the amount of characters that that are actually embodied on that poster yeah, but it was the, the same in the background is insane. but it was the same with um, Days of Future Past, the last film which had so many characters in it as well and yet they were all kind of given their, their fair share of, of you know screen time and dealt with fairly in this it's very unbalanced yeah but the, the the thing is though just because you've got a ton of characters in the universe that you're working in doesn't mean that you have to try and use as many as you you, you can possibly can um the, the whole point of a film is to not confuse your audience or try to let your audience latch onto characters and even though we know these people um it doesn't mean that we want to actually see them you need to actually hold back on some of them for uh, future films. Don't just think that, oh, well, uh, that, that Marvel film there has got 20 different um, characters in it. Let's have 15 or 20 or pretty much the same. We Stop doing that. It's not who can beat each other with the most amount of people on screen at once. It, you need to make a coherent film. And unfortunately, coherence isn't even a strong point in this film as well. It just it, it doesn't feel like it is trying to create a, an interesting movie it just feels like it needs to have vignettes of different um, set pieces involving a few little characters here and there 
then that's how the film is constructed. Um, I, I think Apocalypse is pretty much a one-dimensional character. It's this very, very typical Marvel problem in all of their films, not just Marvel films as well. I'm not just hitting on that that um, th that area. Um, uh, DC as well. DC fall into that ca category of having one-dimensional bad guys or pretty much no-dimensional bad guys. And Apocalypse is boring. Oscar Isaacs just doesn't seem to care. He has one spark where he does an Independence Day-esque kind of speech where he elevates um, his voice. And that's pretty much it. He's supposedly the ultimate mutant. And it's just weird the way they actually go, yeah, he's got that He's got that power, he's got that power, he's got that power. So what? That That's not interesting. All the tertiary people around him, they're boring. They, they just are boring. Storm is a really interesting character. Angel is a really interesting character. Nightcrawler is, Cyclops is, Jean Grey is. All of the X-Men have got really interesting backstories. Yet in this film here, because the younger versions of them, they, they just didn't feel like they wanted to give them interesting backstories to them. And there is a, a part of the film itself which completely sums up this movie, is when they are pretty much taking a stab at um, Star Wars. And um, it said that the third movie in a trilogy is the worst. And that was the stab at Star Wars. And I'm thinking to myself, I you know, really I, do need to look yourself in the mirror and see that the third part in the original X-Men trilogy was the worst. That's kind of what it was trying to make a stab at, I think, more than just using the, Star Wars. And the third one in this trilogy is the worst. So just just because you think you're self-aware on that front doesn't make doesn't think that that comment there is intelligent. You actually did make you worse in this part of the trilogy as well. So... It was just lackluster, lackluster on every single level. Yeah, it, it just it's it's surprising that Brian Singer did this, and then I think it, it does feel more like Brian Singer has gone. I want to do, and I don't want to spoil it, and so it is. But I think he's setting up to do a character, a big thing he wants to do in another trilogy over three films, and because of that, I think he went right. I want to do that. I need to set that up in the next film, in this film, and that's what he's done. That's what he's done. He's gone. I, I'll use Apocalypse to set that up, and that's what you shouldn't do. You should, you should focus on your own story, and if you're going to do another trilogy, the setup of the trilogy is it is in the first film of the trilogy. So wait till the next film to do that. Don't just go. Oh, I'll do another film in the meantime to set that up. It, that's a waste of material, especially as there is good material here. It's kind of insulting as well. Yeah, it, 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 it's just. It's boiling down some really interesting characters into caricatures of themselves, pretty much. It, it's just using um, interesting IP and then just not doing very much with it. Mm. Or what you do actually create with it is the kind of thing that you would have uh, winced at on Saturday morning television. As a matter of fact, if you want to find out how to create backstories to these brilliantly, brilliantly created characters, watch the original animated TV series. Because that's where you're going to find a lot of interest from not in this film at all. It's not going to make kids go, "Oh, I want that. I want this character. I want to follow that one. I want to go with that one." It's not going to make them do that. Um, Hologram for the King is the next film up. Um, it's directed by Tom Tyke, where it's based on a, a book. I can't remember who the the person is who wrote the book, but it's supposedly um, in an interview with Tom Hanks, he did turn around and say that uh, the author is very reluctant to give up his uh, properties because he believes that a lot of the stories that he creates is really difficult to turn into films. That hasn't stopped directors in the past doing that um, with uh, material where it's really difficult to do. Look at... Um, the Wachowskis, they're obsessed with trying to take um, unfilmable kind of um, material, but even um, World War Z, that was looked at as um, a series, a film that couldn't, a book that could not have been turned into film, and had a good stab at that, and sometimes it, su it succeeded. But in this one, it's a very simple story. It um, stars Tom Hanks, who plays Alan. Um, he's a businessman. He works for a company who creates sort of like virtual reality technology in a way. It's Skype but Skype in about five, ten years' time where you get a hologram of the person who you're actually in the conversation with. So then you can pretty much do presentations, although the person can actually uh, do other sides of presentations and things like that. And so he is sent from his company who he works with over to Saudi Arabia to have um, a discussion with the king of Saudi Arabia who is trying to create pretty much his own Mecca. 
um, his own city in the middle of the desert. And so he gets there um, for the few, first few days. He's banging his head against a tent, to be honest, because that's where him and his team is thrown into it. And turmoil between him and his team actually starts to erupt a little bit when they don't even get good Wi-Fi or good food. Here's a clip. King is not coming today, so you guys can just relax. Shouldn't we call corporate and let him know the conditions here are untenable? No, Brad, we should wait until I talk to Kareem Alamad at 3 o'clock. Do you know why we're not in that building? Well, maybe all the vendors are in here. And maybe we're just the first. Kind of weird being rallying than being out here. It's a brand new city. It's uncharted territory, and we are the trailblazers. Where are we supposed to eat? Guys, come on! We are in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia! With the deserts, and the camels, and the sheiks, and the tents! Oh! Oh my god! Oh. Are you okay? Uh, yeah! Don't you know, they can only kill me with a golden bullet. <coughs> golden bullet, you know, you get it? It's Lawrence of Arabia. Who? And so, yeah, it's up to him to try and um, get his, his plate across about this hologram technology, all the while, while coming to terms with this sort of like lump that's on the, his back, which is causing a lot of restless sleep. Um, and also him establishing a relationship, not just with the doctor who um, tries to help him with this lump, but also he's, um, he's pretty much his chauffeur. He's played by Alexander Black, who plays Yusuf. Um, the thing with the film is, the best thing about the film is Yusuf. It, it's sort of like com the conversations between Alan and Yusuf. That's the interesting part of the film. The rest of it is dull as dishwater. It's a pretty v mundane movie. Very little happens in the film. When something does happen to it, it barely wakens you up from your slumber because you're just bored throughout. It isn't an interesting film. Um, him going over there with uh, hologram technology sort of is an okay idea, but trying to flesh that into a film that might work is questionable. There is a couple of questionable scenes as well. Considering it's a 12 year, there is a scene inside of a nightclub which involves drug usage. You do actually see some drug taking happening. And there's also a quick glimpse of um, some nudity in the movie as well. And it, it makes me think, did they manage to actually slip those through the BBFC? Um, it's the kind of thing that you would not see in a 12A. You wouldn't see um, drug use in the way it's actually done in this film. I know it's a fleeting scene, but it's still there. It's the kind of thing that would have been cut out of a film. Apart from those two, which woke me up a little bit, the rest of the film just bored me. It, it bored me, apart from the use of character, which I found very engaging. I found um, Alexandra Black did a pretty decent job. He, he holds the film. Tom Hanks, um, he's a very good actor, but his character is not interesting. Um, it's just not very interesting at all. And when he does have this relationship with his doctor, who's played by uh, Sarita Chowdhury, again, not really interesting, to be honest. So I just found myself, when I walked out the cinema going, I'm going to forget that film. Um, and if I wasn't reviewing it, and I was reviewing it in about six months' time on Blu-ray and DVD, I would have actually had to re-watch it again because I would have completely forgot about the film. It is completely forgettable. I largely agree with that, I have to say, because I, I did find that there was parts in it, and I didn't think it was bad. I just found it was very, very humdrum for the majority of it there's there's nothing to it and, and it's a shame because there's a great setup there there's some great shots of the the scenes sort of out in the desert where there's this big tent which is being set up for this presentation and the presentation itself sequence that's really really good as well even though it's kind of done in a very quick kind of montage scene um there's a, there's a great potential here for this story of this this character who's kind of finding himself stuck in a rut and even right at the very beginning there's there's a great sort of dream sequence which which is the literally the opening shot of the film is this great dream sequence you see part of in the trailer and it has him doing this whole thing of saying you know um he's sitting on a roller coaster as it gets more dull and dull and dull and saying everything the same everything the same everything the same and unfortunately as much as the film is trying to then build that rut and then build the character out of that rut by the end of it, it doesn't really manage to do it. It does, you know, it develops the character to have this happen, but you don't feel it. You don't feel the character has got out of the rut. You don't feel, you just feel the monotony of the character's life, and then you feel the character's gone 
Oh, okay. I'm in this rut. I'm better. He it, it doesn't. He it, it doesn't feel like. You don't feel like. Ah, oh, this character's in a rut. Oh, this character's gone through that. Oh, this character's feeling much better. This character's come out of it. You know, winning at the end, sort of thing. It just feels very much kind of like. Yay! This happens. Yay! This happens. Yay! This happens. Yay! This happens again. Yay! This happens again. Yay! This happens again. Oh, yay! He's all better now. It's ended. That's it. It's it's just very very straightforward, simple. No chances. Nothing exciting. And I don't. I'm not saying I want action again. I, I just want good character and good sort of sequences that are exciting not visually or not, not action wise but just visually and story wise and it's just not it, it feels like it's not there yet it, it, like I said it, the use of character is the only one it is a lot to which and, I, I actually gravitated towards but he does and the thing is I did find as well the character at, at times almost bordered on that kind of too much of the stoner kind of sidekick character I did find that very kind of I was very wary of that character throughout but the then film you're, in a way that. you're sort of like reeled back a little bit when you do see his proper life for, for example when his character does take him sort of like out in the middle of nowhere to meet his family and um, yeah I, uh, I would have uh, loved to have seen more of that I would have really really loved to see more of that that just basically seemed it just basically seems like a setup to, to set up this whole scene of this, this character that has this kind of um, epiphany moment but it doesn't even really pay off this epiphany. So it could have had more to it. It just doesn't have the, it doesn't have the oomph that it should. Unfortunately, so it's definitely one to avoid. Um, on the last film, then. Okay, that is Sing Street, which is uh, written and directed by John Carney. It is a uh, fict- fictional drama um, about um, a group of kids at school. That, um, the the main character, Cosmo, is played by uh, the, an actual introducing performance are uh, by Ferdia Walsh Pilo I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not I'm not going to try again because I, I can only butcher it if I try it again um, who is basically um, in the uh, 1980s he's basically uh, in a sort of uh, private school um, he's pulled out of that by his parents um, he's told sort of at the beginning of the, of the day one day his parents uh, are sort of always fighting not getting on well um, there's money issues because the the father is uh, basically he's uh, um, struggling to find work his wife has been put down to only working so many days a week and there's their, the, the three of their kids uh, there's uh, Cosmo there's his uh, sister who is going through um, her own issues and there's his brother who's a college dropout and a bit of a kind of a, a stay at home bum who's basically just there um, not doing much apart from being able to give uh, his younger brother advice because he knows about music he's very very into his music and Cosmo decides he wants to start up a band because of the fact of that he uh, meets this this girl at his new sort of typical local school. Here's a clip. That was, that was bad, bad, bad music, and there is nothing as bad in this world as bad music. You know, you can record over tape. No. That was a novelty act. You want to have actual sexual intercourse, right? Yeah. What? Well, what? The girl. It's all about the girl, isn't it? Yeah, the girl. Yeah. And you're gonna use somebody else's art to get her? Are you kidding? We're just starting. We need to learn how to play. Did the Sex Pistols know how to play? You don't need to know how to play. Who are you, Steely Dan? You need to learn how not to play, Connor. That's the trick. That's rock and roll. And that takes practice. And you're not a covers band, by the way. Really? No. Every school has a covers band. Every pub has a covers band. Every wedding has a covers band. And every covers band has a middle-aged member who'll never know whether they could have made it in the music industry or not because they never had the balls to write a song for someone else. Rock and roll is a risk. You risk being ridiculed. But I don't know how to write a song. Close that door and sit down. Really? It's going to be a long night. Of school in the morning. This is school. school. So you have this whole thing going on of the character then putting together this band in the school with um, people that he meets and then they get, they go going and being in the 80s they then go out to places and start recording songs they've written and um, st- with the, one of them around with a old style video camera and recording it and editing their videos and stuff. Um, also that uh, Cosmo can sort of win the attention of uh, this girl Rafina played by Lucy Boynton um, and it's... Um, it's a good drama because it's not just about that it's, it's, a, it's a thing about 
these characters developing into a band actually getting really good um, putting themselves together and um, ending up sort of at one point they end up sort of um, playing for the the school dance sort of thing um, and there's even a, a sequence in there which is really really good where it goes from being uh, about them sort of at a rehearsal and the character sees how they could be like a real band and it's all proper and it's all clean up they've got it's like a proper music video made which is really really nicely handled it gives a it gives a great feel to it because all the way through the film there is this little bits of humor that crack it up and break it up and and make you really really sort of ingrain you to the cat ingrain the characters to you um you you're sitting there and you really kind of get into them and join them as much as when they're when they're standing there playing and there's someone videoing it and it's it's really badly recorded really badly edited like fake music videos that someone has done but it's the thing of that you're watching it and it's like it's that kind of it's so bad it's good and it's the heart that's kind of gone into it that this film has plenty of it and i really enjoyed it i didn't know what to expect going into it at all but i was really impressed and by the time i walked out i'd had a really good time with it as much as i i thought there were moments in it where normally i would have gone yeah not getting it i got into it and i had a lot of fun with it and enjoyed it yeah again as i keep on harking on about my cinema they're rubbish my cinema <laughs> but um it's considering that in this i live in a city in a city that only has one cinema which is ridiculous that and um, yeah they weren't showing this film so it would have been a trek for me to actually go and see it and I did actually want to go and see it because it, it, it reminded me when I, I um, watched the trailer very much like scenes from like a sunshine on Leith or um, in a we- kind of weird like movies like Pride it's got that look to it it, it does yeah so it did, that's one of the reasons why I want to see it because um, I think we've been spoilt by v- brilliant British films over the last few years of that kind of ilk where it's set in like everything from the late 60s up to the mid 80s and uh, we've seemed to be able to latch onto those kind of movies and that looks like it, it belongs in that kind of uh, that, that category there so I, I want to try and see it I don't think I'll be able to get to see it but I do want to see it I, yeah. I do recommend seeing it I mean it's a shame it's not getting the treatment I think it is but I think this is one of those films where because it does seem to be getting good word of mouth and it might hopefully stick around a bit that it will get kind of the attention that it does deserve. Yeah, it would have been nicer if um, English and British cinemas would look at British films and give them a bit more of a platform over the big American movies. I'm not saying replace um, the latest X-Men and put these kind of films on the biggest screen possible. I'm saying look at one of your screens, look at a film that you've put on that screen, see how long that film has been out, and you, you can say to yourself, you know what, I think it's we, might, we should end this one week early and replace it with a film where even if there's two Sean's a night it, it's not going to harm it it's going to give it a chance to try and get out there to a bigger audience yeah even if, even if it's something well you get, you get a lot of cinemas have things like Captain America on in you know three or four screens so it's got 20 showings a day or something still um, and as much as it's going to be taking that money if if you got rid of one of those screenings anyone who was going to go and see that one would just go and see it in one of the other ones because they're, they're, ne- they're not going to be sold out now at this time so you could sacrifice one of those showings to have a showing of another film which might draw more people in and people will go and see it as well you know and there's some cinemas like mine that decided to show Spectre for too long they decided to show The Hunger Games for the the run was like 10-11 weeks who's going to go out to see the film again 11 weeks down the line um, it, it's about to come out on Blu-ray and DVD and they were still showing it mm. or for example they might have a U-rated film and they'll have a show at like 8 o'clock at night parents are not wanting to take their young children at 8 o'clock at night to see a film in the cinema so use that screen there to show two showings of movies like this it's it, it just at least spread it out and give it a chance but that's a different argument for a different year anyway uh, we'll be back any in a moment with the blu-ray and dvd section after this ad break there was a real sense of you were doing something wrong but that did give it that that feeling of excitement when the reveal of the film happens that's when it just becomes absurd and the atmosphere and just the sense you get whenever you go into it is undeniable it, it did absolutely zero for me which could be for the hype what we've just discussed there is just scratching the surface on it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contracted, and you're listening to From Page to Screen, the horror show. And we're back with this week's Monday Movie Show, going into the DVD and Blu-ray releases in the home section. We will have a look at the charts in a moment, and then we'll be going through these new releases. 
Yeah, um, big cast in drama, The Big Short. And again, another film where it has a big, really interesting ensemble cast in Spotlight. We dredged the bottom of the barrel, especially for Robert De Niro's career, in comedy, Dirty Grandpa, and then sci-fi drama with The Fifth Wave. And then the last three films is Spanish-German one-shot movie, Victoria, the sequel that nobody wanted in Kindergarten Cop 2, and then we round things off with first-person um, zombie horror film with Pandemic. Yep, but as I said before, we'll go through the DVD and Blu-ray Top 10, starting at number 10 with Alice in Wonderland. Is this the original card in one, or is it the Tim Burton? I think it's the Tim Burton one, um, because the from the list I can see here, the cover, it has got that kind of weird psychedelic cover, I think, but... I have, I'm not entirely sure. So, well, if it's the original <laughs> Disney one, then that's a really good film. If it's the yeah. Tim Burton one, then it's not. I think but it would be that one because of the fact of the something that comes out next week. Yeah, Alice through the Looking Glass is out on Friday. You can mention the name of the film. You know, we're not, well, I was, we're not advertising that book. I was yeah. kind of setting it up because there's a clip at the end of the show for it. Yeah, well, still look. But uh, <laughs> Alice through the Looking Glass is out on Friday. Um, th- if it is that one, this one was directed by um, Tim Burton. He's producing the new one, James Bobbins, who did the last Muppets film. Um, well, not Muppets, the second Muppets film. He did the first Muppets film. Uh, most, one. most Wanted. Yes. Yeah, Muppets Most Wanted was yeah. the second one. Yeah. Uh, James Bobbin didn't do that one. Oh, okay. He did the first uh, Muppets film, but he's the one who's directing um, the sequel, and it's been getting pretty decent reviews actually, and it looks fun. Um, whereas if this is the Tim Burton one, it's not fun. But if it's the Disney one, it is fun. Okay. Head, That's um, confusing. Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking, what? Uh, number nine is Lady in the Van. It's a good job the next few films are very easy to actually explain. We've said everything we can about Lady in the Van. It's got a f- 20, first 20 minutes, which drags a little bit. But after that, it, it's given um, dear Maggie Smith a platform to actually be brilliant. Room is at number eight. I absolutely adore Room. It, it's still definitely in my top five of the year and it'll probably steer there Spectre's at number seven and we've said everything Awful. we could say about that but so we'll move on to number six which is a new entry for I Am Wrath surprisingly is an attempt to have I Am Wrath in the top ten but you've seen it you reviewed it last week and I haven't seen it yeah and I I actually if I have to compare the two I like Spectre better than this it's it really is a straight to video kind of remake of things like things you've seen before like Death Sentence nothing new to it, it it's just a typical kind of revenge thriller thing it's an hour and a half long I think as well I remember it's not especially anything brilliant and it's just it's one of these things you go John Travolta what's going on with your career you've been here before and you got out of it with things like Pulp Fiction why did you get back into it because he did stuff like Battlefield Earth after Pulp Fiction, and so that's why he's back into it. So it's, it's possible, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's a good job because you challenged me to watch this, and yeah. you had to supposedly watch Mojave, which only went in at number 33. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to watch that. I had no it's chance to watch good jo- It's a definitely a good job because it, I, Mojave is horrid. It's a horrid, horrid film. Um, yep. Yeah. Daddy's Home is at number five. I didn't find it funny at all. It, it, it's, I found it quite offensive at times as well, very stereotypical of uh, these kind of movies where it does go, yep, we have a gay joke in it, wink wink, haha, <laughs> funny isn't it? We have a, a racist joke, yeah, it's really funny isn't it? We have somebody flying through a wall because he's trying to ride a bike, yeah, it, it's funny isn't it? And No. That bit was funny. No, it's not. Yeah, it was. It was in the trailer. Uh, but yeah, it, no, the, the end result of what happens though wasn't in the trailer. He punches the wall and he goes flying down them. It's still not funny. It, it's just, no, it's bad. New entry at number four for The Danish Girl. Not a new entry. It's been in, out for a few weeks, The Danish Girl. Uh, according to where I'm looking, it says new entry. Oh, well. I thought it's been out a few weeks anyway. It feels like it's been out a few weeks. Um, very good performance by Alicia Vikander. Eddie Redme in this. It didn't deserve the plaudits that he got from it. The whole film is just lacking. It just doesn't have um, that, that impact there. Every all the supporting characters don't have room to breathe they're not actually given uh, anything decent to do Matthias Schoenhertz especially um, it's just he's left on the weird side of being a love interest of Alicia Vikander's character and I just think that the film itself would have been much more interested in if it just concentrated on both Redmi and, and Vikander's um, sort of like relationship solely rather than try to bring in other characters or just have the film about um, Vikander's one because I think she's the much more interesting out of the pair. The uh, movie number three is Star Wars: The Force Awakens. 
Yeah, lots of rumours and speculations and stuff like that are flying out there about Star Wars Episode Eight. Tons of it, too many actually, to be honest. Um, it, I feel I'm um, pretty sorry for all these people who are trying to avoid spoilers for um, the next Star Wars movie because they're just going to be a deluge of stuff over the next year and a half before the film. As a matter of fact, we're going to know the entirety of the the next film before it comes out. Um, this one is a good film. It's it, it's a good idea to get somebody like G.J. Abrams to re um, start the Star Wars series to kick off the new trilogy because he's really good at handling those kind of films. It reels back lots of the lens flare, which is a good thing as well. So it's not like Star Trek Into Darkness where you can't even see any of the actors because there's just a light shining across them. It looks like they are getting beamed away. Um, but in this one, it's got some really good acting in it. Uh, it's Dizzy Ridley and John Boyega bringing them as the new characters into the into the forefront of the film, which was a good idea. And this is how you handle a movie where you're introducing it to new characters, not the way it's handled in the last X and the, the X Men film. The Hateful Eight has dropped down from number one to number two. It takes a while to get going. It's a movie that could have easily had a good 45, 50 minutes cut away from it, but it's Quentin Tarantino. He will never do that. As a matter of fact, if you gave him the chance, he would have extended the film before it was long. And we um, had um, scenes about them sitting beside the fire just being racially bad at each other, and that, that gets on my nerves as well. Yes, um, Quentin Tarantino, you know the N-word. We don't need to hear it every two seconds. Um, it's annoying. Uh, but yeah, it, it's got some good set pieces in it, but it's not a brilliant film. Which means the number one entry, new entry this week, is Creed. Yeah, it's nice to actually see this going straight in number one because it does deserve it. Um, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Taylor Johnson. Why was it? Who the heck is Michael Taylor Johnson? Uh, it's half the guy from uh, Kickass, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Michael <laughs> B. Jordan. Well, I don't know why I was thinking that. Michael B. Jordan. So it's sort of like. Um, Sylvester Stallone handl- handling the torch over to a new breed of um, boxers in, in, in the frame of this because he does play uh, um, what's his character's name in it? Uh, Rocky, you mean? Or no. Apollo, uh, Creed? Uh, um, Don- Adonis Creed? No. Yeah, Adonis. Yeah, Is that? It, it, just, yeah. it does hand over the torch to it uh, to him so it, it's a good idea to actually do that. Uh, Ryan Coogler why can I remember the director's name, but I can't even remember the character's name in the film? Um, he does a really good job of setting up um, the series, and we definitely actually want to follow his career. We want to follow it. I don't know if we want to actually follow it in a like five films, but I definitely do want to go and see another film, and I would never have said that about a Rocky film. Yeah, I, I was never a big fan of the Rocky films, but I did really, I, I did really, really enjoy Creed. I got into it, and it was nicely structured, and a good sort of all round kind of a like an homage to the to the Rocky films I think yeah so that's it for the charts let's move on to this week's new releases then um, the big short um, we've had a deluge of films that uh, revolves around um, the banker's crash in 2008 um, a lot of movies and a lot of them actually hit margin call was one of our particular favourites uh, it, it's a really interesting film who would have thought that uh, a movie about money would have been interesting but it, it was the case and then you have it, even if you go uh, before the, the crash of 2008 and you look at movies like Wolf of Wall Street it's still taking that idea of uh, money laundering and people using other people's money and all that kind of stuff and making an interesting film out of it and that's pretty much what Adam McKeer has gone and done with um, um with this film in, in, in the big shot because he's taken the the story of 2008 when um, a Wall Street guru Michael Burry who's played by uh, Christian Beale he discovers that there is a problem there is a problem with the housing market and the fact that a lot of homeowners are actually in danger of defaulting on their homes as a matter of fact it, it's a huge amount of money that that's going to harm pretty much the economy of not just America but a, across the globe and he sees that this is going to happen, but nobody believes him. He sees this bubble is going to burst, and he tries to get as much investment as he possibly can to trying to throw money at, at, at the default to try and get some swaps involved in it. And obviously, the the people who he works for isn't happy about any of this at all. He's a clip. He's been in there for seven hours. I already got a breakdown. He's letting the fire tank. No, he actually prefers that you email him. Excuse me. 
Mr. Fields, Mr. Hi, Lawrence. We have no confidence in your ability to identify macroeconomic trends. You flew here to tell me that? Why? Every, a, a, anyone can see that there's a real estate bubble. Actually, no one can see a bubble. That's what makes it a bubble. That's dumb, Lawrence. It's always markers. Mortgage fraud quintupled since 2000 and the average take-home pay. It's flat, but home prices are soaring. That means the homes are debt, not assets. So Mike Burry, a guy who gets his hair cut at Supercuts and doesn't wear shoes, knows more than Alan Greenspan and Hank Paulson. Yeah, Dr. Mike Burry, yes, he does. <laughs> Now you've got other characters who actually see what's going on and they take note of it. Um, Ryan Gosling plays Jared Vanette. He, he actually, there was a another clip which I was intentionally going to play, but I couldn't be bothered to bleep out the swearing there of it. So um, it's just him having a conversation inside of a bathroom and he's sort of like latching onto what's going on. You've also got Steve Carell's character who plays Mark Baum, and then you've got other people, uh, including uh, Rafe Spall as well, who discovers what's going on and their intention is to follow um, uh, Barry's sort of like lead and look at what he's doing and then sort of like in a way trusting him because they might act that this bubble is definitely about to burst and these people are going to make a lot of money off um, the turmoil of what the banks have managed to do with other people's money from houses and l losing homes and all that kind of stuff without warning them and it's an interesting film it's very well acted from pretty much everybody involved because and I don't want to keep on harking on about this, but again, this is how you make an interesting character film. The fact that you don't just give them little tiny snippets and then forget them for a little while and then come back to them. When you do give them little tiny snippets, you need to make those memorable snippets. And that's what happens in this film. You've got a lot of characters on shore in here, but everybody's got an interesting story. Yes, you look at it and think, this is deplorable what they're doing. But then you think to yourself, well, they were the smart ones. They saw this happening, yet you still had a lot of people going, no, this is not going to happen. We're, we're not going to see an implosion of our economy at all. We're, we're, we've got a strong economy. And then when it does happen, they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it was too late for them to actually turn things around because they were too idiotic to actually believe in people who saw this and they thought, yeah, we know better, when they didn't. And so it makes an interesting movie, and especially because you've got strong acting from Ryan Gosling, from Christian Beale, from Steve Carell, from Marissa Tomei, from Rafe Spall. Everybody involved in the film, and some very good directing as well. It's a complex uh, movie to try and put on the screen, and it's a complex movie in the front that you have to actually latch yourself onto these people and not feel disgusted about what they're doing. You need to look at it and think, if you do think you know what, these were the smart ones, then you're going to really get on with this film. However, if you do go into it and you, you're you halfway through the film and think, this is disgusting, this, and just still stick with the disgusting part of it, you might as well switch it off because it doesn't get any better for you. So I employ it, actually switch it on, keep it on to the end, because you're going to find a really interesting film in that. It, uh, yeah, it's a very enjoyable movie. I agree, and I think especially the the roles are really well written and performed. But I think they are the fact is that they are really well written to a point of that they're not just people that are going. Oh, there's money. We, there's money here. We can make it. It's a thing of that. It's people that, that that. I mean, some of them style like that. But then you have people like um, there's a character like uh, the bit with Brad Pitt has a small role in the film um, because his production company I think is involved again. Um, but he plays this guy who's a uh, like an ex uh, Wall Street dealer and he's basically pulled into it by guys that need his help to deal with stuff because it's kind of above their knowledge um, and they're celebrating of you know we've made a killing on this money and he turns around to him and goes hey guys you just bet against the American economy think about that before you start celebrating you're gonna you know it's gonna lead to bankruptcy uh, foreclosures and all that kind of thing and he, he kind of brings them back down to earth and it's things like that and the Steve Carell character who's him and the guys when they realize what's going on they go oh this is really going to make a lot of money and everything but my god if this happens this is going to be the end of loads of things it's going to be so bad so they they know that obviously it, it's bad they're going to make loads of money off it but it, basically it's going to happen whether or not they want it to or not and they end up basically saying well it's going to happen we need to do this otherwise we're going to be in the same situation as all these other schmucks that caused the mess 
and yeah. you know so that's that's what makes them kind of nice and instead of being just greedy bad guys they're good guys that are just basically stuck in that situation and they go if we don't do this we'll be as bad as everyone else you know we'll be in the same situation so it's it's it, that's what it's interesting character because they're kind of believable and they're real yeah it definitely doesn't feel like you're watching actors on no. the screen you're actually watching characters you're actually it feels like you're watching a new story to be yeah. honest and that's that's the way to make these kind of films because again if you if you hear a movie that that's based around um an economy crash or money you're going ah oh, this is not going to be interesting but when you've got a director who wants to make a really thought-provoking film out of it then a very smartly done film as well then you're definitely going to find something interesting in there which goes for that and also for the next film as well because there are similarities abundant similarities between the two films in their style between the big short and also spotlight which is um, written and written by Josh Singer and uh, Tom McCarthy. It's directed by Tom McCarthy. It is a true story uh, about uh, the Boston Globe that in 2001 started to investigate stories and things that they had fa- they had heard about the possibility of um, child molestation being covered up by the the Catholic Church, um, and then finding out that this potentially happened not in one place, not in two places, but in loads of places where. Uh, priests have been sort of uh, uncovered to be doing this but it's been kept quiet the priests have been sort of moved away somewhere else and it's all been sort of you know swept under the rug sort of thing you have this um, team of investigators led by uh, Michael Keaton's character you have in there Rachel McAdams Mark Ruffalo um, and you have kind of their boss sort of the new boss brought into the paper above them is the one who's instead of someone often you get someone comes in they go oh, we don't want to do this because it could potentially be a risk he's saying i want you to go into this i want you to look into this i want you to do more i want this found out um and we're going to do this right um and because of that obviously michael keaton's character at one point has to have a confrontation with mark ruffalo over the fact of that we're not ready yet the story isn't ready yet here's a clip we, we got law this is it no this is law covering for one priest there's another 90 out there yeah, and we'll, we'll print that story when we get it, but we, we got to go with this now. No, I'm not going to rush the story, Mike. But we don't have a choice, Robbie. If we don't rush to print, somebody else is going to find these letters no. and butcher this story. Joe Quimby from the Herald was at the freaking courthouse. Mike. What? Why, why are we hesitating? Barron told us to get law. This is law. Barron told us to get the system. We need the full scope. That's the only thing that will put an end to this. Then let's take it up to Ben let him decide. We'll take it to Ben when I say it's time. It's time, Robbie. It's time. They knew and they let it happen to kids. Okay? It could have been you. It could have been me. It could have been any of us. We got to nail these scumbags. We got to show people that nobody could get away with this. Not a priest or a cardinal or a freaking pope. And what's important about that clip is you, you feel the character's frustration with things you you feel the 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 tension that is, is building between them because of this story that they found and just how shocking it is and it really is brought to the screen in such a way that it's not that it's a, a film that it's you know you, you come out and you go oh, i didn't want to watch that it was really really demoralizing you watch you come and you go that was really really quite shocking that they found that but it's really really well handled it's a great drama the fact is that these these people went and did this they went out they found it and they went and exposed this horrible truth this horrible thing um and it's it's similar it is kind of a similar thing to uh the big short in that in that it is a performance drama film driven uh, drama driven film acting driven film sorry um which is just filled with great performances from a a all-star sort of cast and it, it's an ensemble casting and i mean it won spotlight won best picture and um big uh, big short was up for best picture as well at the oscars last year the two of them were up for it um and spotlight won it though the two of them are so close i think i think um uh big short won for best script uh, best screenplay uh and spotlight won for best um uh, uh, well best film I, I see it more as being a, a win for best ensemble performance because it is an ensemble piece and it's a great drama and the two of them as much as they are kind of a hard watch they're a great double bill of 
performances that it's it's worth seeing even if you don't really go for that sort of thing you would at the very least come out of it having been sat there and been entertained for two hours each time you would not have come out of it and been bored yeah um, definitely it's a it's a hard um hard story to watch but as you heard in that clip there with uh, mark ruffalo how passionate um his character is in there and uh, it needs a strong actor to be able to actually put that to the to the forefront and that's exactly what the film is um it, it's a really well created film really interesting movie it's, it'll make a, an interesting double bill with the big shot um it's going to be a difficult double bill to watch but it definitely will make an interesting double bill on that front and uh yeah it, it, it is a movie that needs to be seen yep unlike daddy grandpa <laughs> <laughs> Uh, directed by Dan Mazur. If you've ever wondered what can cause an actor to destroy their career, we've already mentioned John Travolta with Battlefield Earth. He's obviously tried to put as much money as he possibly could into that project and it tanked badly. Um, you've looked at other actors who were sort of like deemed as really good actors and then all of a sudden make a stinker of a film and then just go downhill from there. And that's pretty much what's been happening with Robert De Niro's um, career as of late he's been just picking and choosing awful films one after each other and then in this case he reels in Zac Efron as well who sort of like try has been trying his best to build up something reputable but then decides to knock it down pretty much every single time when he adds a new brick to a very interesting wall and so the film itself centers around um, grandfather and grandson played by De Niro and Efron um, Efron's character is about to get uh, married however um, his grandfather tricks him into taking him um, just away to Florida on a spring break and where they can just do as much horrible things as they possibly can. Here's a clip. I don't understand how we got so far off schedule. Anybody work here? Okay, everybody on the oh, floor! What the, this is what? a robbery! <laughs> oh my god, you should see your faces! I just went out to grab lunch and a new horse mask. I left mine at the beach the other day. Woo! <laughs> Guns are real, though. Relax. This is Florida. Everything's a licensed gun range. You just shot through a wall, man. Hey! There's pedestrians outside. Yeah, again, it's Florida. These people don't matter. What? So, welcome to Tan Pam Surf Slam. What can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm Pam. Now, if you look at reviews for this film on um, IMDb, you'll see that critics have... It's got actually a rating of 16 on there, yet you see the public have actually taken more kindly to the movie. There are a lot of, like, six stars upwards reviews of this film. As a matter of fact, there's a couple of ten stars oh, saying that the film is absolute comedy gold. I'm easily on the side of the critics. Um, it's an absolutely deplorable film because it, it's it's one of those movies where it takes all the gross out humour, um, very much like uh, the Hangover series, and then just gives it to an actor like Robert De Niro, who you're thinking to yourself, just don't please don't say that, don't say that like oh he said that line, and yeah you're pretty much killing your career. You're not just hammering a nail into the coffin. You've made the coffin. You've actually laid it with felt. You're lying in the coffin. And for some strange, weird reason, you're able to nail shut this coffin and bury yourself. Because that's what he's doing. And he's dragging Zac Efron down with him. It's horrible. It's not funny at all. Um, two people at my work said, Oh, this is one hell of a funny film. I laughed all the way from beginning to end. And I've been standing there flabbergasted. Just wondering, did you, were you actually watching the same film? I know it's a movie with the word dirty in the title and grandpa, and you're never expecting it to be like Citizen Kane. But come on, you at least you expect a joke to maybe give a little wince or make you smirk. Not the fact that it makes you go, oh, I really hate myself at this moment in time. I just really hate myself for watching this. And it's, it's awful. It's really awful. Yeah, I, I was expecting more from you than that, actually. No, it, it's just, just one of those movies where you can't even be bothered to rant about it because it doesn't even deserve that. There are times where um, I think both of us have seen really horrible films and even ranting about it is giving it publicity in a way and we just don't want to do that with this kind of film. We want people to completely forget them. And if you're ranting about something over the top, people are going to listen to your rant and go, oh, I need mm. to actually watch this film to see if it is as bad as it is. Yeah. Well, but I mean, saying that even 
in more detail things like you were saying about the film earlier that had sort of gay jokes and everything there is a continual line of gay jokes in this film amongst other things that are completely well they're just un I, I can't even think of the word they're just it, it's so bad choice and bad taste that it's just deplorable like you said it's just it's horrible yeah the, there's a one here on IMDB this person gave it 10 stars and a final line in a sentence said, Trust me, don't listen to the other critics and give this movie a shot. You won't regret it. I will definitely be recommended to my friends. I'm so glad I'm not that person's friend. Because <laughs> if this film was recommended to me, I would just unfriend you. Okay, uh, The Fifth Wave is a, um alien invasion drama um, that's uh, directed by Jake Blakes and it's based on uh, a novel I don't have the name of the artist here but it's based on a novel that um, tells the story of uh, Cassie the, the main character played by Chloe Grace Moretz um, and it's basically sets up the whole thing of that there have been four waves of an alien, alien invasion uh, the first wave is sort of them arriving um, there was um, a wave where there is a, a virus that uh, sorry a wave a, a a virus that sort of um, released and uh, kills off a lot of the population. Uh, there is a series of sort of earthquakes that start to destroy things and, and have affected them. Um, and then there is this whole situation of that the humans then end up the remain the survivors end up sort of living in sort of small camps where uh, the uh, the the military turn up and basically take the children and tell the parents that there is this uh, there has been this situation of the that there is now potentially this fifth wave attack coming in where are where there are aliens amongst us uh, so the children have been taken basically so they can be trained because children uh, the aliens can be detected in if they've been taken over uh, adults not so luck so not so lucky um, the leader of the, the sort of the military resistance uh, played by Lee Schreiber has then sort of taken these children and starts to sort of effectively condition them and train them um, even though they're not really old enough to be soldiers in the new war. Here's a clip. Our intelligence tells us the others are readying themselves for a final attack. The fifth wave. If they are successful, humanity as we know it will be wiped from the face of the earth. Now. I'm going to tell you some things I know. This is our world. It is our home. They will not overrun it. They will not possess it. So whatever time we have left, you will learn to think, speak, move, and fight like the soldiers you are. Let the weight of our loss fuel you. Let the weight of our dead embolden you. Let the weight of our hope drive you to victory. Can you do that? Oh. Oh. Soldiers, can you do that? Sir, yes, sir. Good, good. So, here's the thing with Fifth Wave. It is, it, it kind of feels like an alien invasion light film. And I say that because of the fact of that it's, it's a film that starts off with the whole, sort of, the whole thing of the... This, you see sort of the flashbacks of the waves as they happen, these things happening and, and it does have a sense of scale to it but it's, it's the thing of that it, it, the problem is then the film focuses on the character of Cassie um, who is separated from her brother, her brother has been taken, her younger brother has been taken off to this, uh, these sort of military training camps um, and she is wandering in the wilderness until she meets up with another character and they sort of start travelling together um, and it's the thing of that it, it has this starts to then do that whole twilight romance thing going on in the circumstances of the you know post-apocalyptic end of the world sort of thing and that for me just didn't work i did not care did not care at all about the characters they, they just didn't really meld for me they didn't work for me um when it starts getting more into the whole thing of the the doctrine of the uh, the kids at the military school and the thing going on with them being trained to be soldiers uh, then I thought it started actually getting kind of interesting and the, and the question of that the morality of that sort of thing happening and then there is a revelation that I do not want to spoil don't want to go into spoilers that comes later on that then leads into sort of the last sort of third of the film and actually takes it in a 
bit more interesting direction and I liked that as much as it was very predictable I thought as that sort of started to happen um, and I'm annoyed a bit because it kind of goes through all that and it's it, it shares similarities with things like Ender's Game I was thinking at times it's not not similarities in the type of film it's a very very different type of film Ender's Game is a big sort of space epic sort of thing this is a more down to earth sort of thing about but it's, it's the whole morality of children in that situation stuff that I thought was interesting that I thought Ender's Game got the point very well covered and very well sort of executed in the way that it it, it affected the viewer this didn't have that hold on me this didn't have that effect on me this had the point of that it finally started getting interesting and then it ended because obviously they're trying to set it up to do further films i don't think that's going to happen because i don't think it's done well enough uh, which is a shame because i would have loved to have seen more of that and i don't know maybe in the next film we, if, we, if it happened we probably would have got more of the romance relationship thing which is the weakest part of this film I think it's, it's actually it doesn't work with the rest of the story I think it feels very out of place and again there a revelation there coming as well is, is very kind of like oh yeah well we knew that was happening it's just it, it's very much a predictable story film that has nothing new to the whole post-apocalyptic alien invasion military thing it, it brings nothing new to any of it um, and it's just very kind of you, you get to the end you go oh well yeah saw that knew that was coming saw that happening would like to see more but it's not going to happen so eh no I wouldn't like to see more it's a movie that has an identity crisis it, it just hasn't a clue what it want, wants to be um, it's sort of like if you look at movies like Red Dawn and Tomorrow When the War Was Won um, yeah they're, they're movies that are aimed at the wrong audience they, they're, they're both all three of those films are rated 15 uh, and that's its biggest problem, unfortunately. It's the fact that its audience is the teen audience. And yeah, that that is 15, um, but you need to look at the people who would go to see this kind of film in the cinemas, 12, 13, 14, 15. It's not 15 upwards, and it was aimed at the wrong audience, and it could tell. You could tell with the film itself that it's so muddled and the way it's actually constructed that it just doesn't know what kind of film it wants to be. Whether it wants to be... Um, this movie where it's about morality and training children to be um, soldiers, it sort of like questions um, the way society handles that kind of thing, whether it wants to be a movie that, that's all about the end of the world and how we can handle that, or whether it's a movie that's all about a romantic relationship or the kind of, uh, if, is it possible to have a relationship during this kind of um, crisis it, it's just a movie that just never has an identity and never follows through with any of it because once it starts to do it it just throws it out the window and never becomes interesting. Um, Victoria, I'll quickly uh, just do. Uh, I reviewed it a few weeks ago on the the cinema section of the show itself. It is a movie that every now and again you hear a film billed as um, it's shot in one shot. There's a horror film called Silent House, originally a Spanish movie, then it was remade. Um, Elizabeth Olsen isn't it, was in it, and it wasn't very good, the remake. That was supposedly dubbed as a movie that was shot entirely in one shot, and it's not. It was actually shot in three chunks, and they did together. This film, um, directed by Sebastian Schipper, is actually shot in one shot. It's set between the times of 4 and 7 o'clock in the morning, and um, it was shot three times. Um, the first time, uh, um, the second time, the director thought, let's try to do it a bit out of order, but then I'll edit it together. And then he decided to shoot it for a third time, and the third time was the version that they kept. And it follows the character of Victoria, a Spanish woman, who gets caught up in um, a bank raid by these German guys she meets after ending her shift at a nightclub when she's about to go home. And they sort of like ask her, oh, do you want to follow us? Do you want to come to a nightclub, etc.? And she just wants to go home. And then she gets embroiled in um, a, a bank robbery with them, and then ultimately falling in love with one of them, and bad things happen in the space of like two and a half hours and it's a really interesting film very well directed extremely well shot because there are some really difficult camera um, angles to try and obtain in a movie that is one shot a cam an easy thing that you th would think that somebody climbing up a ladder with a camera on it might be a simple thing to do with a cameraman though that's not as easy as you might think because you've got the chance of editing that together to make it look like a fluid shot Whereas in this case, it needed to be one fluid shot because everything needed to flow properly. There's this fight scene inside of a car as well, where the camera actually goes through a car 
and the way it's actually done is the cameraman quickly passed it to one of the actors and quickly passed it out while he ran around the car the back of the car to get the camera when it was coming through that they had to do that really quickly to get it done properly and so yeah it's a really interesting film to watch from that standpoint of view if you're a cinematographer you definitely need to see this film to see how that kind of tricks is done because you will learn a lot from it but from an interesting thriller point of view it works because the actors have got it's just really difficult to actually do because they've got to do everything in one take without any mistakes at all and there isn't any mistakes in the film so it's very well created a very interesting film so seek it out okay uh, kindergarten cop 2 uh, yes there is a sequel to the uh, original Arnold Schwarzenegger film which is more than 20 years old now um, find it in the, if you're in the US it's on Netflix in the US <laughs> Look at them. Um, it's directed by Don Michael Paul um, it is uh, this time instead of Arnold Schwarzenegger we have Dolph Lundgren in the role of the character Reed um, who is an FBI agent and uh, at the beginning of the film there's a big shootout thing and we find out that there has been uh, somebody has hacked into the witness protection system and has the information for that uh, it turns out the person who has hacked into there and stole the information is a teacher at believe believe it or not a teacher at a school um, who has disappeared and so of course uh, Reed is sent to go into the school undercover as a replacement teacher so he can find this hacker and find the information and make sure that it's been recovered and hasn't gone out to be sold and you know get everyone in trouble and uh, yeah exactly that sort of thing it's it, it's a awful it's this 20 years later or oh, what can we do we can make money off something we let's we need a title we can do something oh let's do a remake of a film that's 20 years old that was not especially big success then but it's you know got interest over the years and we'll do you know what we'll do one straight to video quality that tries to do all these horrible gags that tries to make it about him being in the school and the school is all up to date and politically correct and and crazy and everything and no the original one what was really good about it was the fact of that Arnold Schwarzenegger having to look after a room of 20 kids all under the age of five years old that's funny a teacher at a school where he's trying to find out what's going on and he's actually sort of investigating the school and not actually having to deal with all the kids which there is a couple of moments in this but it's not really dealing with it is not funny it's boring it's awful it's it's honestly honest to god one of these things of like you, you watch it and you go why just why just I mean you can see I don't know if they bother or not if they'd gone back to Arnold Schwarzenegger and tried to get him to do it but um, if they had he might maybe have been smart enough and gone nah thanks I read the script it's rubbish because the film is rubbish it's just rubbish it is rubbish awful it, 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 it's rotten it's sort of like they've tried to remake a Kindergarten Cop um, but then they thought let's put a two on it so it doesn't look like we are remaking it when you're in fact it is a pretty much like for like remake anything that it tries to attempt to rehash from the original one like like Andrew said there it's not a brilliant film but you watch it now and it's still quite funny um, the, the kids are actually quite funny in it as well and these they're just annoying I, I laughed oh, once annoying. I laughed once at a sequence where um, he's talking to them about a USB stick and it's like one of them goes I know what that is that's a flash drive and then all of a sudden the kids start talking and they become fixated on talking about the the uh, the, the class's uh, hamster and everything he, everything he asks them is just a question uh, they just keep saying about hamster uh, the hamster this the hamster that and it's just the kids have this one track mind about the hamster and nothing else and it's just basically like you know that the kids the kids are actually not bad in the film surprisingly Dolph Lundgren is just uh, Dolph Lundgren honestly sits, stands there and looks as if he's kind of almost looking what am I doing here how did I get here I know I, I haven't had the best of careers but I've been in Expendables recently and that was pretty good so why am I here there is supposedly this is actually sums up the entirety of the film there is a joke in the film where somebody gets shot in the crotch with a teaser and he soils himself mm. there you go that sums up kindergarten cop 2 it's a soil your pants kind of film uh, pandemic it's the final film of this week's show directed by john suits it's one of those uh, like i said when i reviewed hardcore henry we're going to get a um a deluge of movies that are shot first person this is again another one of those movies it's shot entirely in first person um, it centers around the character of Rachel um, Lawrence sorry, who is played by Rachel Nichols, Nicholas and it's set during a zombie apocalypse and the whole film is from pretty much her viewpoint you do see every now and again switch it to a normal camera but it's pretty much from her viewpoint from a camera that's attached to a helmet about a group of people who need to try and survive during a zombie apocalypse 
that that's pretty much the basic storyline of it it's it's not bad actually it's it, it's direct to dvd fodder but it's still the first person thing adds a bit more tension to the movie um if you're trying to build up tension this is a good way of actually doing it because you feel like you're in their shoes this would work brilliantly in vr these kind of movies would work fantastically in that kind of thing so if you if they release it on that um and i know that um that um IMAX and um, there's a 3D company that are working on VR films uh, at the moment and I think they were speaking to directors like James Cameron and Ridley Scott so there, there are um, there are potential um, virtual reality films out there and these kind of movies would work for that kind of stuff so if you like zombie movies if you like your gore there is a lot of gore in this film um, but yeah it, it, it's not bad it's quite it's Saturday night brain dead kind of film but it's still an enjoyable takeaway, a few beers kind of Saturday, Saturday night movie. It's not the kind of movie that you would expect to find as the last movie on our show, because we normally go for the bargain basement kind of stuff. This is a movie that's actually much higher than stuff like Kindergarten Cop 2. But yeah, it, it, it's it's not bad. Okay, so uh, as we round up, usually we're going to go through TV movies of the week. I got two. One of them being Kindergarten Cop. I just I saw that it was on TV and I thought, you know what, I'm going to write that down. So it's on ITV One on Saturday the 20th at 10 to 4. I did. I saw it, but I didn't write it down. I, I just wrote that down just because, in spite of Kindergarten Cop Two, because the, the that that's a miles better one. But I might as well just go on my choice. And um, the only other one I've got written down is on Film Four on the early hours of Sunday morning. <laughs> um, so Sunday the 29th at 1:45 in the morning, Chronicle. Quite the Josh Trank yeah. film um, I really like Chronicle don't okay. call it a found footage film because it's not but it's yeah it's a really it's, it's film. found footage styled it's found footage esque but it's not yeah. a found footage <laughs> film because the last scene in the film is set in the, the uh, in sort of like in the Himalayas kind of thing and the camera is left there so how can you find that footage there because it's footage that is found during the film but it's sort of like stitched in because it's found movies. later no it's not, it's never found <laughs> there's rumoured supposedly a sequel to try they're trying to actually create a sequel to it but okay don't. my tv movies of the week, i've got two again as well um my I, i've got one choice but my other one that i'm going to point out is um on the now the mine both of mine are past midnight so on the night of sunday the 30th of may or monday the the monday the first of june or monday the 31st of may i can't remember um, um first first um but uh, on channel four at 12 30 a.m so 12 30 at night um is the two faces of january um and i'm putting out because of the fact of that it's a film that's worth seeing to see oscar isaacs in a really good acting role a uh, really good performance because he's just really not given much to do in apocalypse um and it's I, I i don't love it but i do like it and i love the way it's shot and it, it's nicely done and i think it's a good sort of it's a not a typical kind of thriller uh but i'm gonna go for another film on really late uh on film for wednesday the 25th of may so wednesday night thursday morning at 1 30 a.m is scott pilgrim versus the world because i do love that film i think it's really nicely done i think it's a great job by edgar wright i the only thing i i do wish about this film is it had been released in 3d because it would really suit 3d uh, but it's a funny film that I love from start to finish. I've watched it so many times, and it's a it's a giggle fest all the way through. And it's just it's a style, lots of references if you if you're a gamer, um, and lots of moments I think that will just make anybody smile if they're into any of that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, so that's it for this week's show. Um, some shout outs as usual. Uh, you can find us and places like MondayMovieShow.co.uk. You can find us on Twitter at Monday Movie Show. Stuart's on there at Cryptic Tadpole. I'm on there at AHDVD. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Monday Movie Show. And you can find us, obviously, you're listening to us. Where you're listening to us, I don't know. You could have been listening to us live. Could have been listening to us on Speaker's website later. Could have been listening to us on iTunes. But if you haven't and you're looking for us, you can find us on any of those. Give us some feedback. Uh, give us some ratings on there. Let us know if you have any suggestions or anything like that. You can do that as well by emailing us mondaymovieshow at yahoo.com and of course feel free to check out we have following the gamer which we'll be doing i presume a special in a couple of weeks time for e3 yeah we have a normal show as well a week before that but she and who's in the live chat on this week's show he's one of the co-hosts of that show yep. um and also a couple of sites uh, following the nerd.com where we'll also be making appearances and we have uh, some sort of 
interaction with them and also from page to screen.com which has uh, the, the horror podcast as you heard and other podcasts in the ad break and you're involved on the horror ones still aren't you for yes yeah uh, is there any of them come up saturday or when we're recording next so one of those to come up in the next sort of following weeks as well uh, all that leaves us to do is of course movie of the week make it a double bill between the big short and spotlight I'm saying that as well for DVD, but if you do want to go see something at the cinema, see Sing Street, because that is a, well, yeah. I can't recommend it. Uh, but I'm recommending you to go and try and go see it, because I know you can't really, but if you get a chance, you will have to go and see it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's it for this week's show, though. Um, as usual, we'll play you out with a clip for an upcoming sh- upcoming film we'll be reviewing next week, uh, which is released, is Alice Through the Looking Glass, the follow-up to, of course, the Tim Burton one, directed this time instead by... James Bobbin. Yeah. Um, so of course uh, we'll be back next week with that amongst other other releases. Uh, until then, bye bye. Bye. Have I come at a bad time? On the contrary, you are afraid you weren't coming at all. What's the matter? The hatter's the matter, or the matter of the hatter. The former. No, the latter. Oh. <laughs> Tweedles. I... He's mad. The hatter. Hmm. Mm. Yes, I know. That's his muchness. That's what makes him so... him. But he's grown darker, less dafter, denies himself laughter. Mm. And no scheme of ours can raise any sort of smile. We'd rather hoped you might help us save him.